we begin the day with the biggest hospital in Gaza on the verge of flatlining. Israel's war against Hamas has entered its sixth week, and hospitals inside Gaza are now on the front lines. Unprecedented Israeli rocket attacks have forced tens of thousands to flee their homes with nowhere to go. Many are sheltering inside hospitals, and that includes the Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest inside the Gaza Strip. Doctors have described the situation inside as catastrophic. With no power, patients are reportedly dying. Surgery is taking place under the light of cell phones. Outside, Israel says that its soldiers have reached the gates of Al-Shifa. We have more in this report. Stitching up a head wound by the light of a mobile phone. Doctors in hospitals in northern Gaza are struggling to save patients. Here too, at the Al-Shifa hospital, they're running out of fuel, water and medical supplies and are vulnerable to the ongoing Israeli airstrikes in the area. Hospital under, under fires. The last example is Shifa Hospital ICU. There is another private obstetric hospital was targeted directly today. And two of our colleagues who are specialists in obstetric and gynecology were killed to, tonight. There is no service for pediatric patients in the northern area. Israel denies targeting civilians and says that this footage is proof that its military provided the Al-Shifa hospital with 300 litres of fuel for its generators, but that it was rejected by Hamas. We offered, actually, uh, last night to give them uh, enough fuel to operate the hospital, operate the incubators and so on, because we have, we have obviously no battle with patients or with civilians at all. Uh, and I think every civilian death, every... The dead baby is a tragedy. But that tragedy should be placed squarely at the responsibility of Hamas that is keeping its military installations inside hospitals, its command posts inside hospitals, inside schools, inside uh, UNRWA, UN facilities and so on. The director of Al-Shifa has denied rejecting the fuel, which he says would not have been enough to power the hospital's generators for even one hour. The worsening situation in northern Gaza is forcing thousands to flee southwards, mostly on foot. Even some health workers have made the decision to leave. The situation last night was very tense, very extreme. The bombing targeted schools and hospitals. I work for the Office of the Ministry of Health at the hospital. Yesterday, the Israeli army bombed the hospital where I work. That's why today I did not go to work or fulfill my duties, and I fled. Tens of thousands have already fled the ongoing missile strikes and ground operation. Israel is coming under increasing international pressure to minimize civilian suffering in Gaza. So what is happening inside Al-Shifa Hospital tonight? To find out, I spoke by phone with the head of surgery at Al-Shifa, Dr. Marwan Abu Sada. Yes, it is inside the hospital. No one can get outside or in, come inside, especially using the ambulances. No ambulance is getting from the Shifa or coming to the Shifa Hospital. We are in total siege in, mo in most of the building. No electricity, no fuel, no water for even personal use or no, uh, no food also. And we are having here in this hospital now around 600 injured people who are located, distributed in the whole of the department. Plus to that, we are having now who are temporarily placed from their neonatal IC unit. We mm -hmm. are having babies, 36 babies are alive, and they are placed in a, not in a good atmosphere. They are placed in one on the main surgical theater. We have to treat them because the Israeli, why we moved from the neonatal unit? Because the Israeli bombarded the oxygen generator. And due to lack of oxygen and loss of oxygen, we lost three lives of these babies. And also, if we would like to run these generators and oxygen, we need to maintain, first of all. And secondly, we need the fuel to run the generators there. And also, yep. in addition to that, we have resident in, in the kidney dialysis unit, patients who are having kidney in their stage renal failure, 
and they have to put them on the machine for uh, kidney dialysis. Yes. And unfortunately, for the third day, we cannot succeed to run the machine because we need electricity and we need a desalinated water, and we cannot do this in Shifas. Yeah. That was Dr. Marwan Abusada there, head of surgery at Al-Shifa Hospital, speaking with me earlier. Well, I'm joined now by the Middle East analyst Nathan Thrall. Mr. Thrall is a former director of the Arab-Israeli Project at the International Crisis Group. He's also the author of numerous books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including his latest, which is called A Day in the Life of Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. Mr. Thrall, it's good to have you with us tonight. Your book, it starts with a traffic accident. A Palestinian school bus overturns, children are killed, and, and from there you describe the tragedy that is the Israelis and the Palestinians and their conflict. What goes through your mind when you, when you see the images of these hospitals in Gaza, now places of healing that are now places of, of suffering and death? You know, I've I've never uh, felt this much despair over the future of Israel-Palestine. Um, this is on a scale that we have not seen before, and um, it is a, a horrific tragedy. I mean, the the amount of uh, death, the amount of civilian death, um, seventy four percent of those killed in Gaza now are women, children, and the elderly. And um, we need to find a way to stop this immediately. I want to let our viewers know you are a Jewish American. You've lived in the U.S. You, you now live in Jerusalem. Um, October 7th, the, the terror attacks of that day, um, did they change your perception of where it is that you live right now? Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, I think the the consequences of October 7th and this war uh, for both societies cannot be overstated. The, the, there, this is going to be a, a decades-long effect uh, of this war on, on both societies. And for the first time in my life, you know, I can imagine um, civil-on-civil uh, conflict. I can imagine this uh, spreading easily to the West Bank. Uh, it's already, we have a huge surge of, of violence, of settler violence in the West Bank. Over a thousand Palestinians have been displaced uh, just since October 7th. Um, what, what we're seeing right now is really uh, something we have never seen before in Israel-Palestine. Mm -hmm. And what you're, what you're describing there, what you fear could happen, that, that would be a, a, a victory for Hamas, wouldn't it? I mean, we, the leaders of Hamas have said that one goal of the October 7th terror attacks was to create a permanent state of war for Israel. Yes, I mean, the, the victory for Hamas will be, first of all, if they receive a massive prisoner exchange, as many Israelis are, are contemplating uh, doing right now, that will have been um, a political victory that uh, no other Palestinian political party will have achieved. The issue of uh, Palestinian prisoners is something that touches every Palestinian family, even if they don't have a member of the extended family in jail now. Every extended family has had uh, members in jail. Uh, we're talking about, you know, 40% of the adult male population that's been imprisoned at one time. And so uh, th that would be the, the first uh, victory for Hamas. And the second victory for Hamas will simply to be to survive uh, this war and remain in place. Israel is vowing that that won't be the case. I don't know any serious uh, military analyst who really believes that uh, Hamas will be eradicated by this mm -hmm. war. So what we're looking at in one way or another is a situation that Israel ends this conflict very far short of its uh, goals. Hamas uh, remains in place, and we, uh, the world, remain living with a situation of uh, deep injustice where 7 million Palestinians, 7 million Jews are all mm -hmm. living under Israeli rule, and the vast majority of those Palestinians are living without basic civil rights. Mm -hmm. And that's a situation that has to be addressed uh, when we're thinking about the day after ending the immediate bloodshed in Gaza. 
What would you say that the, the terror attack on October 7th, what did it do to the ability to criticize the Israeli government, it, its policies, its leaders, without being accused of being anti-Semitic? I mean, it's made it much more uh, difficult in the West. Uh, and even in, inside of uh, Israel, you've seen Israeli uh, journalists, you've seen Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, whose uh, speech has been curtailed. And, uh, and of course, in, in Europe and uh, the US, we see all kinds of uh, voices being silenced. Um, and, and the main tool to silence them is the accusation of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, for years, uh, pro-Israel advocates have used a, a totally illegitimate uh, definition of anti-Semitism that includes things like uh, uh, stating that the, the state of Israel uh, is racist. And, you know, the way that race is used these days, it's not the 19th century version of, uh, you know, uh, four different uh, archetypes of, of humanity, that race is used broadly in international law to include any kind of ethnic or religious or, or racial or other discrimination. And, and that kind of discrimination plainly is practiced uh, by the state of Israel. But you're not allowed to say that without falling uh, in violation of the so-called IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, which is the International Holocaust. Cost Remembrance Association's uh, definition. And that definition has been spread across Europe and the United States and made it very, very difficult to speak honestly uh, about what Israel is doing against Palestinians, uh, the fact that it is a form of ethnic domination that mm. is uh, at its core discriminatory. And, uh, and this comes at the expense of the real battle against uh, anti-Semitism, which is coming largely from uh, right-wing racists, not mm. those who are trying to defend uh, against uh, regimes of ethnic domination. The Jewish German-American author Deborah Feldman, she lives here in Germany. Um, she wrote a guest commentary piece that was in today's Guardian newspaper. And in that, she writes that the German government's unconditional support for Israel allows it to ignore the way dissenting Jews in Germany are being thrown under the bus as they are in Israel. I mean, do you agree with her? Are, are, are you, would you be thrown under the bus um, in Israel by saying what you're saying to us um, in public there? Well, I mean, you, you, we don't need to go to hypotheticals. We can see that um, Palestinian citizens of Israel were arrested just a few days ago, including former members of uh, the Knesset, the parliament, uh, for holding a peaceful, attempting to hold a peaceful demonstration against uh, calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, and we see that, you know, a, an ultra-Orthodox Jewish uh, journalist, Israel Fry, was attacked at his home uh, merely for reciting a prayer for the dead in Gaza, the innocent dead in Gaza. So um, it, it is it is an environment of extreme hostility, and there is a great deal of desire for vengeance, which uh, is being echoed by Israeli leaders, such as the president of Israel, who said that there are no innocents in Gaza, that the entire population of Gaza should be held responsible for October 7th. Uh, which is clearly setting the stage for the collective punishment uh, and death of thousands of innocents. Let me ask you before we run out of time, um, just get your thoughts on what we, we are seeing now across Europe and in the United States. Um, last weekend, there were some 300,000 people at a pro-Palestine, pro-Palestinian march in London. It was the largest such demonstration we've seen since this conflict broke out. But there were also Hamas bandanas being worn. There were signs reading, um, no UK politician should be a friend of Israel. And there were also reports of people chanting from the river to the sea. Um, what do you say about that? Um, there, there's, there's real fear that what is happening where you are is being exported to Europe and the U.S. In, in the form of militant um, Islamist goals of violence there as well. What, what do you say about that? So I, I think we need to uh, disentangle a few of the different things that were mentioned at this protest. The, the chant, uh, uh, fr first of all, no UK politician should support the state of Israel or whatever that slogan said, uh, 
there's nothing anti-Semitic about that. I mean, there are many people who don't have a racist bone in their body, don't have an anti-Semitic bone in their body, who don't want their government supporting a decades-long system of ethnic domination by the state of Israel. That's there's nothing anti-Semitic whatsoever about that. And and similarly, you know, this the the slogan from uh, from the river to the sea. I mean, many, many, many Palestinians who support equal rights for all between the river and the sea <laughs> chant this slogan and and they don't have any kind of exterminationist idea behind it they have no desire to see the jews even uh leave to europe they just want to have equality so um i think that there is a very very broad brush being painted right now against anyone standing in solidarity uh, with Palestinians. And of course, yes, if there were uh, Hamas uh, posters, that's that's something uh, different. But I, I think, as you can see from the images you're displaying mm -hmm. on this program, mm -hmm. those are not uh, uh, very prominent uh, as far as I can see. Author Nathan Thrall, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us, and we hope to talk with you again. Thank you. Thank you.